Good morning. It is Wednesday, I believe. Uh, it's all a blur during coronavirus, sitting at home, doing nothing. Um, I'm so bored, I can't stand it. But uh, yeah, it makes me appreciate all the ministry stuff I get to do. Uh, but I sure miss going to Corbin and teaching and seeing the kids there and then going to South Salem High and mentoring the kids there and going to Restoration House and preaching and Samaka Place and preaching and just, you know, all the other things that I get involved in. Um, it's just crazy sitting at home. You can tell I uh, haven't shaved in a few days. There's no purpose. There's no reason. Uh, I'm not seeing anybody. Uh, but I did want to get back to one of these videos. You know, I did a video a while back uh, last week on depression. I think a day or two later, I did one on anxiety. Uh, and I said I was going to be doing, uh, you know, some of these counseling videos uh, just you know, every once in a while, uh, no, no rhyme or reason to when I'm doing it, just what I feel like. So uh, today we get PTSD. Uh, PTSD is near to my heart um, because I have it. <laughs> uh, I've struggled with it since, oh gosh, probably, oh man, 17 years old. I had what they call blade onset PTSD. Uh, I went through a lot of child abuse as a kid and, and lived in 12 different homes and was homeless and didn't eat and, you know, all the things you do when you have that kind of lifestyle. And uh, uh, I thought I was fine. I got out of high school at 17, thought I was good, and then the wheels fell off. And uh, I started exhibiting uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Uh, but at the time, nobody knew what, really what that was. Um, you know, it's interesting. What I want to go through today is what PTSD is and certainly what it is not. Uh, some of you may know that I worked at the Oregon Department of Veterans Affairs for seven and a half years. And one of the things I did was I worked with veterans making sure that if they had a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, we could get them the help they needed and uh, get them the benefits they earned through their military service. A lot of times we think PTSD is just something you get from, from combat. Um, and that's really where it originated. If you think about the Civil War, they called it soldier's heart. Um, it, it, people that got back from the Civil War really struggled with, um, you know, just the aftermath of war. They'd have nightmares and they would have intrusive thoughts and, and various things. Uh, later in World War One, they called it shell shock. Uh, guys would just freeze on the battlefield because they were just, it was just the bottle would fill up and that would be it. And then the aftermath of that. During World War II, they call it combat fatigue. Uh, guys had to be brought off the line because they had combat fatigue. Uh, but what's interesting about all three of those wars uh, and, and, you know, conflicts between them is no one really worried about them after they got out of the service. There was really no program, no diagnosis for it. Um, some of it was considered actually insanity. Uh, there, there's some uh, really gruesome uh, footage of how they treated these soldiers afterwards who had just uh, what we could now call post-traumatic stress disorder. A lot of the times, though, uh, like after World War II, because that's a generation we're probably more familiar with, they didn't talk about their war experience. Uh, every day they went to work, after work, they went to the Legion or the VFW. They had a few drinks. They came home, had dinner. Uh, what happened behind closed doors stayed there. Um, uh, pretty pretty rough. We did, No one really talks about what happened to that generation. And then came Vietnam. Uh, and Vietnam, a, a new experience in terms of combat, guerrilla warfare instead of uh, big armies facing each other. And uh, when those folks came home, they had what we now call PTSD. It was actually a, a diagnosed under the diagnostic manual, I think, in 1978, 79, somewhere around there. And so by the time I got out of high school in 82, um, PTSD existed, uh, but it was mainly for combat vets. But here's what's interesting. What PTSD is, it's a condition, uh, an emotional condition you get because of trauma. Now, that's what's really different about PTSD rather than depression and anxiety. You can have depression and anxiety because you have a chemical disorder in your brain. Not enough chemicals releasing or too much chemicals releasing or whatever it might be. You can have uh, emotional depression and anxiety based upon um, some, some kind of events like grieving and those type of things where you don't recover well enough. But PTSD is trauma-based. It is something really bad happened to you. As a matter of fact, uh, in order to have a diagnosis of PTSD, you have had to have a life-threatening situation or a situation where you felt your life was in danger. Now, what used to drive me crazy when I worked at the Department of Veterans Affairs, I would get these um, veterans that came in that didn't serve very much time in the military, and they'd say they had PTSD from basic training. I just, I just want to kick them out of my office because it's like... No, you don't. Uh, nothing happened to you in basic training that, that gave you PTSD. And really, honestly, um, uh, you're really doing a disservice and disrespect to those who actually went through something. Now, what 
Also as PTSD, though, it's not just combat. If you had a sexual trauma, for example, a rape or an assault, if you had child abuse, uh, if you were ever in a situation, car wreck, uh, where, where your life was in danger, you can have PTSD. Now, PTSD is not a life sentence. It's not something that um, will just never get better. There are therapies and treatments and, and ways to mit mitigate and manage things. So I think that that's uh, really important to know. However, PTSD, I have to close something here, PTSD also is something that uh, uh, it, it comes in, in different levels. If you look at how the VA rates a PTSD claim, you can have a 0% claim, which means you have some, some interference with your daily life, but you're functional. Uh, you can have a 30% or 10% claim um, that says basically you have a little bit more. 30% you're, you have some functional issues. You, you don't get along at work and those type of things. Uh, 50%, 70%, 100%. So, uh, they, they, they rank it based on the, the level of your daily activities that get interrupted. And those activities include work. They include, uh, family. They include relationships, uh, friends, those type of things. They include how, how you deal with the symptomology. So what I want to go through now is symptomology of PTSD. Because you have one or two does not mean you have PTSD. You have to have like five or six of these things. And most of the time when I run into people with post-traumatic stress, I, I give them the list. And I actually have them highlight this, this form I have. And they're around nine or 10, honestly. Um, I know for me, uh, I exhibit, you know, had all but about two of them when I was at my worst. And so what I want to go through is what the, what the symptomology is. And, and what's going on in your brain, that's important, and then what you do about it, because PTSD is uh, something I think that, uh, and we'll get to the biblical piece in a minute, because you know I'm not going to forget that part, uh, but I want to go through the clinical piece first. There's a great book out there. Um, it's it's the uh, uh, PTSD, guide, P PTSD guide from the Purple Heart, organization Purple Heart. Excuse my phone from ringing. Um, it is a support Donald Trump phone call. Can you believe that? Donald Trump is calling me right now, and I'm on online with you guys. So, sorry, Donald, can't get to you. Um, so, let me go through the symptomology with you on this one. This book, I, by the way, is is not just good for combat veterans and his family, because this is for the spouse pretty much to read, too. Uh, it's good for everybody. I'm going to show you a document here. This is the what I call the man in armor, and it gives you the uh, uh, symptomology. So, let me just read through some of these things. Um, you can have intrusive memories. Uh, that is that is something that doesn't mean you just have thoughts. It means that you'll just be minding your own business and bing, something will come into your head. Uh, that That is an intrusive thought. You can't really control it. You don't like it. You don't want it. But it's kind of there. You can have guilt and, and sur uh, shame from survivor's guilt. Let's say you're in a car accident and um, everyone perished but you. And you can have that survivor guilt for combat veterans, obviously, is your buddy gets killed, you didn't, you're standing next to him, and, and why did the bullet hit him and not you? Uh, poor judgment. <laughs> this is uh, uh, kind of a standard one. I, I laugh about it because I think about my own life and just how many bad mistakes I made. Because what you're doing is you're making, mis you're making decisions emotionally. Um, not based upon your reason, your frontal lobe, you're not, you're not connected there. We'll talk about that, but you make a lot of bad decisions. You have bad judgment, uh, loss of interest and motivation. You can get what they call flat effect almost where you just don't care. I mean, it's different than depression where you feel worthless and hopeless and you know, you just like, Oh, uh, you don't, you're, you're apathetic. You don't care. You just don't. And that's a little bit different. Um, and, you know, I'll tell you what, too, these symptoms, not only do they affect you, but they affect your loved ones, I think, more than they affect you. You kind of get used to it, but they, uh, they they would tell you that when people come back from combat or have post-traumatic stress, they're different. They're a different person than they knew, and there's some truth to that. Anxiety is something we've talked about, anxiety, but you can have anxiety. Flashbacks. Flashbacks are a little bit different than intrusive memories. Um, intrusive memory is, you know, I'm sitting here right now, and bang, I think of something like I just did. Um, yeah because I'm talking about it. A flashback is when you're actually almost disassociated and you uh, uh, are back in that situation and you can smell the smells, feel the feel. Uh, you, everything of that moment is like omnipresent. It, it's You're having that flashback. You're right back in it. Uh, you have a startle reflex. Uh, you're easily startled. Um, that That's kind of a normal thing. Uh, sleep disturbances, whether it's insomnia, don't sleep, waking up on, off and on, that could be because of intrusive uh, dreams, those kind of things. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a story about that in a minute about a, a veteran I knew. 
this is one I struggle with hypervigilance. You never feel safe. You don't feel safe in crowds. You don't feel safe in stores. You're always checking your perimeter. You're making sure that you, uh, a lot of people are armed a lot of times um, because they just cannot feel safe because of what happened to them. Uh, lack of feelings. Uh, I would kind of put that as, it's almost like the apathy, but it's emotional apathy. Uh, you disconnect. Uh, you're, it's it's just that again flat effect with emotions. You don't love. You don't hate. You don't. Care, you just don't. You just don't feel. Um, you just numb yourself. Uh, you can have poor concentration and short term memory loss or short term memory issues. It's not loss. It's just issues. Um, yeah, you just kind of concentrate because your mind's just a jumble. Uh, that, that's that's a problem. You can have depression and apathy we've talked about. So anxiety and depression, which we talked about, can be very much part of PTSD. But again, PTSD is trauma-triggered, trauma-based, um, and it's not uh, its not the chemicals in your brain necessarily that are causing it. It's the trauma that caused it, which may, in fact, cause chemical issues. Um, but it's about when we're talking about causation, we're talking about trauma causation versus um, a, a chemical-based causation. You can have comp communication issues. <laughs> I'm laughing about that one because uh, I was in the military and I grew up in a family that swore a lot. And uh, um, my communication issues are when my frontal lobe disconnects, which we'll, again we'll talk about, and it's just me fight or flight going off and off. My communication uh, uh, degrades. Let's put it that way. Uh, it deteriorates significantly. <laughs> um, you can actually have physical issues with this. You can have arthritis and ulcers, cardiac diabetes. Your body reacts to stress. And partly it's because of the chemicals racing through that are not always supposed to be in your body. Uh, but you can actually have uh, physical disabilities uh, that are secondary to your post-traumatic stress. I know a lot of guys that smoke a lot um, because of stress. When they drink a lot, they self-medicate. Um, that's a, a major issue with, with post-traumatic stress. That's a little bit different than depression and anxiety. Uh, you're trying to numb those memories. You're trying to get your head to stop thinking. You're trying to you know, get out of your head a little bit so you self-medicate with drugs or alcohol. Um, there's stress and emotional numbing. Th this is the one a lot of men go through, more so than women. There's frustration, anger, and rage. Uh, you know, we're taught as, as young boys that big boys don't cry. You rub some dirt on it, you know, get up and go, suck it up, buttercup. Uh, if you're in a military situation, you know, there, nobody cares. I mean, honestly, uh, nobody cares how you feel. Um, and so when we become adults and we have post-traumatic stress, the one emotion we're allowed to have, especially in the military, is right, anger. Uh, it's a motivator. And so we tend to mask our pain, our hurt, our injuries, our traumas, by anger, and we just try to muscle through it. And so you'll see a, a hyper vigilance or a hyper sense of anger and um, uh, and even rage. I, I struggle with that personally, and and it's uncontrollable. It's a weird thing. You you almost watch yourself from a third eye doing the things you do, and you go like, I have no idea why I'm doing this. I'm not that guy, but you can't you can't control it. Um, you isolate sometimes, you, you know, sometimes people annoy you so much. It's like, I'm just better alone. No guys, especially Vietnam veterans that just like to take long walks in the woods for three or four days. Um, they just don't want to be around people. Uh, and I, I get that. Sometimes you just, you need your alone time. You need your space. Uh, you have poor self-esteem sometimes and negative self-image. I would go farther and say negative self-talk. If you think about, and we talked about this before, who do you talk to the most in life? It's yourself. And most of what you say to yourself is pretty negative. And so with PTSD, it gets, it, there's a, there's a cycle of real, real negative stuff uh, that can lead to suicidal ideation where you're thinking about harming yourself. You can have suicidal ideation, but you can also have what they call homicidal ideation. Um, that's where probably because your hypervigilance is so high that you think about hurting other people. And uh, um, I was lucky with mine that I had both suicidal and homicidal ideation. It was uh, unpleasant because you're always thinking about, uh, you know, doing yourself in because what's the point? And you're thinking about doing others in because, wow, they're annoying you and they're not safe and, and everyone's dangerous. So, so when you look at the symptomology and you think about uh, PTSD, again, you, you're not, you know, you don't say, well, I'm frustrated, so I have PTSD. No, no you're not. Um, you have to have a multiple uh, conditions here in order to have an assessment of PTSD. So let me tell you what happens with the brain. The brain's an amazing, amazing tool. 
and uh, uh, you've got this 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 part of your brain right here. It's called the frontal lobe, and this is your reason and your logic, and it's kind of the command and control center of of your whole functionality, right? So we have emotions, and we have uh, ambulatory things, and we have all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, in the back, toward the back of your brain here, it's called the amygdala. And in that is your fight or flight, your emotions, and your memories. And, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting how God made this because he put our memories, our emotions, and our fight or flight, which means knowing when there's danger or not, put them all in the same place. And I think he did that so that if we've had experiences in life, that we can learn from them. So if we've been in danger before, we can recognize danger and escape, right? So what happens when there is a, a situation um, physiologically and, and um, uh, in, in your brain is this, you have a dangerous situation, your amygdala area, your fight or flight triggers. If it's real danger and your frontal lobe goes, yeah, uh, this is real, the frontal lobe almost shuts down and the amygdala fight or flight takes over. Your pupils narrow, your vision screw, you know, just kind of whoop, screws in here and um, uh, you are in absolute fight or flight mode. Now, uh, the hard part for a lot of us, especially if we're military men, they, they kind of beat the flight part out of you when you're in basic training in the military. So all you want to do is fight. And that's why we're so aggressive sometimes in our PTSD. But with PTSD, what happens is you're so marinating in trauma. And this is child abuse or sexual assault or uh, even car accidents and these type of things, but combat especially. That your, your, your amygdala and your fight or flight is triggered so much and your memories are triggered so much and your emotions are triggered so much that the frontal lobe just stands down and it's not supposed to. And so what happens is there's a rewiring of your brain and the brain's doing this to keep you alive. It, it, it perceives danger. And so, uh, for example, if I went into a new foster home, it's an unknown situation. Now, I may have had a couple examples of really bad foster homes where there was violence or uh, neglect or whatever it might have been. So my brain is preparing itself for the worst case scenario. And so anything that happens there triggers a memory or whatever. Uh, my frontal lobe is ready to shut down at any moment. And the amygdala is on hyper, <laughs> hyper alertness, ready to, ready to take over and kick in. Um, so with PTSD, when you're struggling with it, at whatever level you're struggling with it, what's happening is the amygdala is running your life. And that means your emotions and your memories and your fight or flight are running your life, not your logic, your reason, um, and that frontal lobe control center. That's a really crude explanation of it, but I think you'll get it. Um, so, you know, what do you do about that? Partly is is you have to rewire your thinking a little bit, right? Uh, and there's a lot of different therapy methods to do that. But I want to bring up a biblical piece since I haven't talked about that yet. Look at David. A lot of times, David, when you're reading David's words, whether it's his Psalms or you're reading about David, you know that this guy was a combat guy. Yeah, there's a song they sang, Saul, who was the king, killed his thousands, but David kills his tens of thousands. We see that David, when he's on the run from Saul, and he's hanging out with the uh, Philistines, he's going to villages and just killing people randomly. Um, the, the guy was kind of cold bloody. He, he sent his one of his one of the 12 guys, uh, the, the mighty men, David's mighty men, he sent one of his guys uh, into the front of the battle to kill him. This is one of his friends so he could have his wife. I mean, this guy's kind of cold blooded. Um, and then there's thoughts with Bathsheba that that was not a willing encounter on Bathsheba's part, which says something else about this guy. Uh, but there's a scene in the Bible, and I forgot to look it up before I started talking today, but there's a scene in there where he's kind of revisiting um, some of these memories of combat. And as I read his his depression and just just how he's writing his Psalms and the things he's talking about, I think he's exhibiting some of this PTSD symptomology we're talking about. Certainly he's uh, he's feeling uh, hypervigilant. Certainly he's got, got some trust issues. Certainly he's depressed and, and anxious. And so, uh, you know, you could go through the list and say, you know, maybe David, maybe David's struggling with some of this stuff. Uh, so I, I think that PTSD, I, I tell people PTSD has been around ever since Cain hit Abel with a rock. Um, we're not supposed to do that. We do things we're not supposed to do. We see things we're not supposed to see. And when that happens, the brain has to protect itself. And this is what's wonderful about how God made us. You know, scripture says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, we're wonderfully made in our brain as well. And the brain does what it can to protect itself. And so uh, you may have experienced a physical trauma 
child abuse, rape, whatever it might have been. And your body reacts a certain way, but your brain's got to manage it because the emotional toll it takes is much more significant than the physical toll it takes for the most part. The body heals, right? Um, the brain really sometimes doesn't unless you get some counsel on it. So when you're thinking about PTSD and you're thinking about how do I go about faith-based counseling on PTSD, um, you, you got to deal with, with certain issues. Uh, they're, they're calling this stuff trauma-informed care now. I was in some meetings, I don't know, a year or so ago, and everyone thought that was the, the latest buzzword. And I was trying to tell them that God's been doing trauma-informed care for thousands and thousands of years. This is not a new idea. The idea of trauma-informed care is basically someone had a trauma. You have to identify the trauma. You have to manage uh, their their care therapy around the trauma. And uh, that's uh, absolutely what I've been doing ever since I've been doing what I do is first thing you do is figure out what happened. Um, I mean, isn't that the obvious question? Um, is there causation? Now, I would tell you from my experience, there's always causation. Nothing comes out of a void. So whether you have depression because your brain chemicals don't work or you have anxiety because you have had a fearful situation uh, or you have PTSD because you've had a trauma, there's always causation. There, there's always a, a, a reason for what you're experiencing. Symptomology is just that, symptoms. I, I get I get frustrated because sometimes people want to they want to uh, uh, they want to address the symptoms, but they don't want to address the causation, and that will never heal you, right? And so, uh, so I, I'm just going to talk about my own situation a little bit because that's the one I'm most familiar with. But I do want to tell you a story about a World War II veteran I met first. So this guy comes into my office, and uh, he was being drugged there by his wife. <laughs> this is a World War II vet, and it's probably, gosh, this is probably 2000 and four ish. No, no, 2005, 2006, somewhere around there. And he wants hearing aids. He wants hearing aids. That, that's all this World War II vet one wants. And it's interesting because the World War II generation really didn't want benefits when they came home. They wanted their GI bill and maybe a little health care. That was about it. So I asked uh, if he had his papers from the military and, he, and his wife dutifully hands over this file and I start looking at it. And this World War II veteran had been in the Navy and he had been on a ship that was sunk. And he had spent, I think, seven, eight days in the water. I'm like, wow, this guy's a, a ship, a sinking survivor. Amazing. And I'm reading through the rest of the paperwork and I see he was on another ship that was sunk. And he spent another nine, 10 days in the water. He had a total of 17 days in the water from two sinkings. And, uh, um, and I'm, and I'm stunned that he's just sitting in front of me wanting hearing aids because obviously he has more benefits coming to him than that. And I ask him, I said, you know, do you experience any um, intrusive sleep issues? Do you, do you have any irritation, et cetera, et cetera? I start going through the assessment for PTSD. And his wife looks at me and says, oh, Tom, we haven't slept in the same bed since 1949. He's thrashing around all the time and I can't sleep. And uh, again, this is 2006, so a long time. And I, I look at her and I said, ma'am, he's reliving being in the water in the in the oil and the fire with the sharks and and surviving and the and the man looks up he hadn't looked at me at all at all during the meeting and just shakes his head up and down and looks back down it was one of the saddest moments of my life thinking that this guy could have had veteran benefits for 65 years but never said a word um that's how stoic ptsd can be you're experiencing things your family's experiencing things you don't say a word why who's going to understand it I mean, honestly, when you've had a trauma, um, it kind of takes one to know one, right? You, you have to have maybe experienced something in order to understand something else uh, that somebody else has experienced. And he could not explain to his spouse um, what it was like to be basically torpedoed and be in the water and watch his friends die and go through what he went through. He just couldn't explain it. So he just never said a word. A lot of guys with PTSD go through that. A lot of, a lot of women who have had sexual assaults, um, uh, that, that's a, a pretty uh, common way women end up getting uh, PTSD is through se sexual assault. They don't say a word. But what you'll notice is they'll start dressing differently. They'll start being nondescript. They'll start, uh, they'll isolate and have depression and apathy and different things. Um, so you, unless you're really trained in looking at uh, somebody to determine if they, they are experiencing some of these things, you got to know the right questions to ask. And so this is why it's really important you get the right right counseling because, um, yeah, just, just wanting to do talk therapy with your friend isn't going to get you through your PTSD and certainly drinking your way through and it's not going to get you there either.
So let's let's talk about what what I experienced. Um, and again, not 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 to use this as anything but example because I don't like using other people as an example very much. Uh, so I I lived in twelve different homes. Uh, Dad was in and out of jail my whole life. My mom had multiple sclerosis, couldn't take care of us kids. Three older sisters. Um, my eldest is fourteen and a half years older than me, so I didn't know her very well when I was a kid. She was out of the house at eighteen. Um, my other two sisters and I bounced around quite a bit, and eventually they aged out of the system. Uh, we would go into foster care and then go back to my dad and go into a family placement and go back to dad and et cetera, et cetera. Being the youngest, I went through more placements, I believe, than anybody. Was homeless, didn't eat, you know, uh, suffered abuse, uh, both physical and emotional at home with dad, uh, suffered physical, emotional abuse in uh, several of the foster homes. Um, I can chuckle about it now. It wasn't so funny back then. Uh, with dad, we either feast or famine. We either lived really, really well, lived in hotels and things like that because we didn't have housing. Um, and then the money would run out and they'd kick us out. Uh, we'd be homeless. We'd get an apartment and probably last a month, six weeks, maybe two months if we're lucky. And then we'd get kicked out. He never paid the bills. He never worked. Um, that constant life of insecurity was never in the same school district for more than a year until high school when I decided to, uh, I left home at 14. Dad got arrested again and uh, ended up with a uh, sister, uh, a couple sisters, actually, you know, sleeping on their couches, kind of couch surfing. And then an old foster family took me in so I could go to high school for my last three years. And uh, uh, that's kind of what um, helped me make it, honestly. Uh, I went to three different high schools my freshman year, one in Chicago, one in Bend, one in uh, um, uh, Beaverton. And I was able to land for those three years at Sunset High. I am uh, grateful to the Terre Haute family for taking me in because it's what set me up to be successful. Because uh, had I not had those three years of stability, um, it would have been pretty pretty rough. Uh, so, I, like I said, I was fine in, until I got out of the situation. And all the anger, all of the fear, all of the trauma, all that stuff kind of hit me at once. And I found myself being a different person than I, than I had ever been. And this is the hard part for people that get PTSD. You change and you don't know why. You can't figure it out because you're still you, but you're not. Um, I went from being a pretty go, fun, go, go around, having, having a blast, joker, you know, kind of a jokester kind of guy, uh, to angry and dark and uh, self-medicating with alcohol pretty severely. Um, couldn't get along with people, couldn't hold a job because I couldn't stand to be around people. Uh, you know, all these symptoms I, I, I talked about hit me. And uh, it was weird because that, that I'd never experienced that. Now, certainly I'd been depressed and certainly I probably had anxiety and different things because of my experiences. But I was able to manage them as, as I was younger. Now, what I, what I think happens is as you get older, your brain develops, right? And so you get to a place where your brain starts to develop enough where it can start to process and once you start processing, that's when the wheels fall off. And what I found with people that I talk with who have had childhood experiences is somewhere around between 19 and 21, 22 is when it happens to them. And that's when the brain's going through its final uh, phases of, of development. Uh, and in men, we finally are developed at 25, girls, women at 22. Um, yeah, I think that that last phase is when we go, holy crap, I got something wrong with me. And in the, in, in the process of trying to figure out there was something wrong with me, uh, man, I was a dumpster fire. Man, I, I caused so much havoc with people and um, just just everything. I was not in a good place. Uh, and unfortunately, hurt a lot of people along the way, which has been probably the, the part that bothers me the most is just how, I, how badly I treated people. Uh, again, yeah, I, I wish I could have controlled it, but you, yeah, I just couldn't, couldn't figure out how to control it. And that's, that's the really hard part. So I get to this place where, um, I'll tell you a little bit of my testimony. So I, I, I joined the army. I was homeless again. I was sleeping in my sister. I was sleeping in a closet in my sister's house. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And so I, I, I actually was sleeping on, uh, I had a room at one sister house in California and I, I just, I, I still didn't have my own place. I had no money. And so I joined the army down in California. And I had a little bit of a delayed entry and I moved back up to Portland, Oregon and moved in with another sister whose closet I slept in. And I, I was in their service and it was great. I, I love the army. The army helped save my life, honestly. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the service and uh, just a lot of bad things started to happen. Uh, I, I had a, a foster brother who I was very close to. This one I lived with in high school, year behind me. He got a paralyzed in a motorcycle accident. 
and that was that was tough. My mom had died a few years earlier, which was rough. I mean, really rough. Uh, I, you know, you lose a girl in college, that's rough. Uh, I had a grandmother who committed suicide, is my understanding, that was rough. And then one day I wake up and I can't move my knees because I've torn them up so badly from uh, actually some sports I was doing in the army. And I go to the, I go to uh, sick leave. I go go to the med, and they, they're going to kick me out of the military. And so here I am, 15 months in the military, and they're going to kick me out before I've ever even done anything. Um, and I'm going to be homeless again, jobless again. I'm going to be exactly right back where I started. And so I was pretty darn discouraged and depressed and down. Now I'd already always kind of believed in God, always talked to God. We had a bad relationship. You know, I thought He was just trying to test me, um, trying to prove I was worthy, because I didn't get my faith very much back then. And so I kind of went to God in my barracks and was, you know, ready to kill myself. And uh, told God, "Look, you got to do something here. If if you got something, we better do it because I'm done." And that's when He intervened. Jesus said, "All I've ever wanted to do was carry you, and you've never let me." And that was like a steel rod through my chest when I realized I kind of had this flashback of all of my life how I held Jesus at arm's length because I thought I was supposed to do everything. I thought I was being tested. I thought I was supposed to endure the hardships, carry my cross, pick up my cross daily, right? Supposed to separate the silver from the dross. All these scripture verses came to head, my head that that said, no, you're supposed to do this. And when Jesus said, no, uh, I want to carry you, it was the beginning of my healing. And that's what I want to talk about here first. If you have PTSD, the beginning of your healing is allowing Jesus to carry you. Um, it's not all on you, and and this is this is I can't I cannot stress the importance of it, but I can't really explain it really well either, because it's supernatural. What I found was when I allowed Jesus that moment in that barracks right before I was going to kill myself somehow um, to carry me, when I realized, yeah, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do, it fundamentally changed my anxiety and my anger and all that into a much more peaceful place where I realized I had not been doing it God's way. I'd been doing it mine, the best way I knew how. But scripture says the ways of a man lead to death. <laughs> yeah, almost did. Uh, the ways of a man lead to death. So if you're struggling with post-traumatic stress and anything, I mean, honestly, anything, um, you've got to let Jesus carry you uh, in your weakness. You've got to let him be your strength. You've got to allow him to come into your life. And you stop trying so hard and listen to what he wants to tell you about how to do it. That, that was the, the very, very first lesson. So what did he tell me? And so I got out of the army and I ended up going back to college. You know, there's a, there was a, I ended up back at my sister's house in her closet, I think, and then uh, ended up going back to the University of Oregon and uh, got an apartment, got, got, I think, vocational rehabilitation to pay for my school from the VA because I was a disabled veteran. And uh, um, the first thing he taught me was about forgiveness, forgiveness. And this is where you start to deal with your trauma based stuff. So, again, if you have causation, if something happened to you and you have PTSD, which means that there was um, there's some, some kind of trauma event that took place. There's forgiveness that you have to do. And there's four areas of forgiveness you got to talk about. You got to forgive yourself. You know, if you had a situation where um, maybe what you did is caused the issue, or maybe you're feeling guilt or survivor's guilt or whatever, you got to forgive yourself. And here's why you forgive yourself because God's forgiven you. And if God's forgiven you, the creator of the universe, who are you to not forgive you? Who do you think you are? You think you're bigger than God? No, you're not. You got to forgive yourself. So, Part of what I had to do was learn to forgive myself in some areas. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm not accountable, right? So the things I did, I did, I own, I, 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 I get it. And um, this gets to the next part of forgiveness I'll get to. You did what you did, you own what you own. But you got to forgive yourself. You can have regrets, but don't have guilt. Guilt is from Satan. It is a chain to keep you down. Regret is from the Holy Spirit. It's telling you, you screwed up, don't do it again. The next forgiveness is that you have to seek forgiveness from those you've hurt. This was a big deal to me. I had to write, I don't know, 10 letters, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 letters, whatever it was, and uh, asking forgiveness from people. And some of it was hard because I knew some of those folks were really, really, um, really hurt by my actions. And what was fascinating was I only heard back from one person uh, from the first letters I sent. And uh, uh, that it went okay. It didn't go. I wouldn't say it went well. I would say that uh, the person was angry, and rightfully so. 
um, uh, and kind of gave me a piece of her mind at one point, which was good. Uh, I hope she got that off her chest, which was great. Um, and I deserved everything she said. Uh, but you got to seek forgiveness. Now understand this. When you ask forgiveness of somebody, they don't have to give it. But that's between God and them. You asking for forgiveness from somebody you've hurt, someone you did, you did wrong, someone you did dirty, that's between you and God. And scripture says, uh, forgive as you've been forgiven, right? So if I've been forgiven for everything I've ever done, chances are good that I probably should seek forgiveness from other people I've transgressed against, right? So you got to do that. And so that first batch of, uh, like I said, one person got back to me and I think, I think we got it pretty much reconciled. Um, but later I talked to a couple other people. I mean, years later, I wrote this letter and I think nine or 10 years later, I tracked someone down and, and it was good, good phone call, got it squared away and, uh, feel really good about that one. But I can tell you what, I got like nine people out there that I asked forgiveness from. I never heard back from. And, um, uh, yeah, not thinking, not thinking it worked out very well. <laughs> so, uh, actually, that's not true. Uh, there were a couple others that, that were good, but um, yeah. So I, I'm leaving that in God's hands. But what it did was it relieved me of that that guilt and shame that I had for what I did wrong, because I know I'm forgiven by God, and I know I've done the right thing by humbling myself and going to them and getting forgiveness. So first thing, uh, again, just to recap gotta let jesus carry you gotta let him carry you second you gotta do this forgiveness piece first part of forgiveness is forgiving yourself second part of forgiveness is asking forgiveness from others third you gotta forgive everyone else now if you've experienced trauma at the hands of somebody else this is really 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 tough because there's a justice issue involved and this is how i got through mine um, some people did some not so great things to me and uh, uh whether it was physical abuse or neglect or emotional abuse or whatever it was um not good. And uh, uh, I always thought, well, if you forgive them, where's the justice in that? You know, how do they get theirs? Um, and so what God taught me, this was good. Jesus was saying, well, look, uh, God's justice is perfect, right? Because God is perfect. And they are going to experience God's justice, just like I am. Everyone's going to experience the justice of God. And what Jesus taught me was, look, they're going to get exactly what they, did, they earned. And no matter what you do, it will never be as appropriate and perfect as what God's going to do. So leave it to him. And that's why scripture says, don't take revenge. Vengeance is, is mine, says the Lord, right? The idea here is God is the judge. His justice is what counts, right? And so I don't have to worry about that. And that was a big relief because it allowed me then to forgive others who had transgressed badly against me and say, you know what? Um... Yeah, they're, they're going to end up in front of Jesus too. And they're going to have to explain their actions to him. And Jesus is going to, even if they're Christians, Jesus is going to say, well, you know what? Uh, yeah, you're in heaven, but you lost out on these blessings because of your actions. I and mean, that's you know, that's a truism. And so same with me. I'm going to lose out on some blessings because of my actions, because again, the people I transgress, transgressed against. So uh, it works both ways. It's a double-edged sword there. So as I'm working through at the time on forgiving others, um, I got to the place where I was like, yeah, I, I trust God. I trust God. I trust that his justice is perfect and I'm okay with that. And once you're okay with that, then it's easy to forgive people because it's not like they get off scot-free because you forgave them. Now, let me tell you one more thing about forgiving others. If you don't forgive others, it's a cancer. Man, it just eats you alive. And they're, they, it doesn't matter to them. They don't, they don't even think about you. But yeah, you uh, you just live and die with that, right? Every day, you chewing yourself out. You, you ever have those conversations in the shower thing? And if I saw that person, this is what I tell them. Uh, <laughs> you got to forgive people. Uh, and if you're worried about the justice piece, get right with God and understand that his justice is perfect. So you're going to be okay. So that that's three. So we've, we've talked about forgive yourself. We've talked about uh, ask forgiveness. We've talked about um uh, seeking for you know seeking forgiveness and we talked about forgiving others now we're going to talk about this last one which is seems weird but you got to forgive god sometimes we hold grudges against god for allowing things that happen in our life this is really tough um i am in my theology a free will guy i believe that god gave us free will and here's why love is a choice it's not an emotion if God wants us to love him, he can't make us do that because if we didn't have choice, uh, it wouldn't be love. 
it would be dictatorship, and that's not what love is. And so um, this is why God says he wants none to perish, because they, he wants to spread the gospel, right? I do believe in the elect, obviously. Scripture says there is the elect. I don't know who they are. Uh, nobody knows who the elect are. God only knows. And so my job is to go out and share the gospel with everybody and share God's love with them um, and telling them that there's a choice they have to make. Now, there's there's a theological uh, uh, school that says, no, there is no choice because the elect are the elect and they're, they're the only ones that hear his voice and blah, blah, blah. I'm not in that camp because I think that that denies the idea that you get to choose love or not. And uh, uh, who wants to serve a God that makes you love him, right? Love me or go to hell. I mean, that's that that doesn't seem like the God I know, and that doesn't seem like the Jesus I read about. Um, but here's the thing about forgiving God: He is sovereign, and the things that happen in this world are allowed, including other people using their free will in bad ways. If you're wondering about how that works, take a look at the book of, of Kings or Chronicles. Um, those books explain that there were what 39 kings in uh, Israel and Judah. And of those 39, only eight were considered good kings. The rest, the 31 other ones, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. But doesn't it say scripture in scripture that God picks leaders? Well, certainly he did. But um, why did he allow them to do evil? Well, they had the choice to do evil, and they rebelled against God, and they did things they weren't supposed to do, and they were punished for it, right? But it's not like that, that God made them be good people. Well, same here. God doesn't make people be good people. Everyone's without excuse. It's not like you don't know right or wrong, but if you do wrong, um, you have that choice. And the sucky part about it is usually it's innocent people that get uh, the collateral damage of people doing wrong. You know, I think about all the children who have parents in jail. Uh, the kid didn't do anything wrong. The parents are a knucklehead and, and now are putting the kids in significant uh, trauma situations because of, of the parents' bad decision. It drives me crazy. But... Again, I know God is just. However, you can get to a place where you don't trust God uh, because of what he allows. And you're thinking, where was God when all this happened? Right? Why, why didn't God intervene? What, you know, why didn't he stop the rape? Why didn't he stop me being abused as a kid? Why, why, why? Um, this is going to be a sucky answer, but it, his ways are not our ways. A lot of people think God is made in our image and not, the vi not vice versa. God isn't just like us. That, he's not like us at all, in fact. He's other than us. Uh, and you got to think about that. He's other than us. We don't understand him at all. The best glance we get at him is Jesus. And we're looking through a mirror darkly, Scripture says. So why God allows what he allows, I don't know. Um, I will tell you this, though. I mean, in my own life, I figured out two things. One, it's only in those, those struggles and in those crises um, that I get to practice my Christian faith for real. When things are good, it's easy to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you and turn the other cheek and all that stuff Jesus told us. It hits closer to home in the middle of a crisis when you're being abused, when you know, something bad's happened. Can you really forgive your enemy? Can you really be Christ-like? That is a much, much harder thing. And that's one way I think that we uh, as Christians have to look at the traumas we went through. Can we actually forgive? Can we actually do what Christ calls us to? Uh, do you want to be a Christian in name only or do you want to practice the faith? So that's one. I think two though is um, God uses everything for the good of those who love him. I know for me I would not have a ministry had I not gone through what I went through. There would be nothing to preach about. <laughs> I just I wouldn't have anything to talk about. Um, I would probably just be living in the world, chasing the almighty dollar and trying to get bigger promotions and higher titles, um, you know, because that was my life for a long time. Uh, but because of my trauma, uh, not in spite of it, but because of it, I'm in the ministry and um, it's my calling. And so I tell people your greatest ministry comes from your greatest pain. So sometimes God will absolutely use your stuff uh, to benefit others. And I said earlier that sometimes it takes one to know one. What credibility does someone have to talk into your life who's not experienced some of the things you've experienced? And let's just be honest about it. Uh, you want to talk to me about PTSD, uh, but you've never experienced it? Um, you want to talk to me about triggers, but you've never been triggered? Uh, yeah, you're not going to get very far with me because you don't understand it. You may be talking about it theoretically or from a clinical perspective, but you don't know. You don't know what it feels like. You don't know... Um, yeah, you just don't know. And so I think that that it's really important 
that if God can do this healing in you, you can move forward and then have it used to help others. That that's the purpose. I tell people that if you've been in the dark and you've and God has led you out and you found the way out, you have a responsibility to go back into the dark and lead others out because you know the way. And and so uh, I think that's another reason God allows what He allows. Uh, it, it's kind of a long game. Uh, we think in short term situations, especially when we're uncomfortable or in pain. But I think God looks at it in the long term and how it's all going to be used. So keep that in mind. So thus far, we've talked about a couple of things. We've talked about um, giving into the idea that you're going to let, let Jesus carry you. That, that, that is vital. And then the four areas of forgiveness. Forgive yourself, seek forgiveness, forgive others, and forgive God. If you're mad at him that he allowed something you didn't like or you don't think he was there, uh, reconsider that. Uh, I have found that when I look back on my situation, God was there the whole time. It could have been a lot worse. And he intervened and intervened and intervened to make sure it wasn't worse than it could have been. Um, and, I, and I'll take that. I, for me, that's good enough. But remember, God is just, so no one gets away with anything. There's nobody that's abused you or done anything to you that's going to get in front of Jesus and get a pass. That, that's not going to happen. So uh, we can be comfortable with that. So what else do you got to do? Um, I think that uh, for me with my PTSD, it was really recognizing triggers. And this is a, a super, I was going to do a separate topic, a separate, separate uh, video on triggers, but maybe I'll just address it here. Triggers are, are things that uh, reignite a memory or an emotion, um, uh, you know, something that, that brings to mind the unpleasantness of whatever it was you experienced. And what's interesting about triggers is it doesn't even have to be related to the event itself. It can be a smell. It can be a touch. It can be a word. It can be a situation. It can be a feeling. Um, it's weird what triggers you. And so one of the most important parts about managing your PTSD is figuring out what triggers you. So I have this exercise I do with people. We, we identify um, a trigger. You know, for me, for example, I, I, had a, I was abandoned quite a bit, so I have abandonment issues. And I know like if my wife's got to go on a business trip for a week, yeah, that one's, that one's tough. That's a trigger. And I know it's a trigger and I know what it's going to do to me. And so what I do and I, I say, this is a trigger. And the next thing I do is say, okay, what's my normal reaction to that trigger? Lose my mind. Okay, good. How do I want to react to that trigger? And I do this replacement kind of thing where I take one idea and replace it for another. Um, I take my faulty thinking and replace it with, with uh, appropriate thinking. And so um, yeah, figure out your triggers. Now I, I have a ton of triggers, uh, because I had a ton of abuse. And so it's, you know, it's, there's physical things, there's emotional things, there's space and relational things, there's all sorts of things, but I know what my triggers are. And in order to combat, uh, the reactions you get with post-traumatic stress, the, the hypervigilance and the anxiety and all the other things, if you can figure out your triggers and start doing what I just said, which is identify how you react and replace your reaction with a purposeful and intentional action, you can get through your triggers. So in the old days, when I didn't know this, I would trigger over and over and over and over again. And that what that means is my frontal lobe shuts down like we talked about. My amygdala fires up and I'm pretty much angry and in a rage um, because that's the emotion I have. And uh, I, I could be like that for weeks, um, just angry and brooding and, and thinking violent thoughts and you know all sorts of bad stuff. When you figure out your triggers and you start replacing them with appropriate actions, you get rid of the faulty thinking and you can you can intervene before you start to go to that dark place. What happens is that becomes the habit. See, a lot of our thinking is habitual, meaning that we think it over and over and over again. So that's what we do every time we have the thought. If you can replace that with something positive, something intentional, something appropriate, that thing will become the habit. And then you can trigger. It's not like you're not going to trigger. You are. You're going to have that smell. You're going to have that touch. You're going to have that uh, episode. But you're going to be able to come out of it much more quickly. So nowadays, if I get triggered up about something, my worst triggers last maybe an hour to two hours, and I can get through it. Um, now, that doesn't mean I'm happy-go-lucky afterwards. Sometimes it takes me a little bit of residual to kind of spin down a little bit. But in terms of being spun up, I can, I can stop the spin. And so you got to know what your triggers are. And that's the second thing that I would tell you is how do I, how do I know? Well, talk to Jesus. He'll tell you. That's, that's how I figured out mine. Um, in my prayer life with Jesus, I'm talking about, you know, how do I control X, Y, and Z? I don't even know what I'm doing. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just kind of ranting. And he's like, look, you had this happen to you. 
and because of this you'll have that and it's very logical the way the brain works if you were hit you'll be uh, uncomfortable around violence or your pendulum will swing the other way and you'll be very comfortable with violence i mean it's it's, it's just basic psychology here um, so i think that that uh, you identify those triggers and you start doing that okay uh, one more piece i'll talk about today because i'm kind of going along um, I, I want to talk about the spiritual warfare aspect of this thing. Now, realize Satan hates you, absolutely hates you, wants you to die. He wants you to die slowly, though, right? He wants your soul. There is a tug of war going on between he and God for your soul. Now, we all know Jesus wins. He's overcome the world. We, we as Christians are, are, are saved and we're safe and all that great stuff. Uh, but that's not, um, that doesn't stop Satan. And let me tell you the analogy I use. During World War II, uh, the, the Allies land in uh, Normandy, right? Uh, it's D-Day. The Canadian and uh, the Brits and the Americans. And we push inwards. And we get to this place called the Ardennes. It's a forest. And uh, the Germans make a counteroffensive. And that's the Battle of the Bulge. And they call it the Battle of the Bulge is because the Germans were able to uh, counterattack and make a bit of a bulge in, in the line. Um, we quickly repelled it and then just marched to Germany. Once the Battle of the Bulge was over, the war was over. Germany knew it. There was no stopping anything. The Allies were coming from the West. The Russians were coming from the East, and it was over. Did the Germans stop fighting? Nope. They kept fighting, and they kept fighting, and they kept fighting, and they were going to take everyone with them they could. Well, that's Satan. Satan's lost the war. He knows it. He's done. However, he's going to take as many of us with him as he can. And so you're going to have a daily battle with Satan. You know, scripture says that our flesh fights our spirit every day. And what Satan tries to do is, is uh, just fan the flames of your flesh. So when you're having those intrusive thoughts, he, his spirit will come in and, and say, hey, yeah, you are a loser. Oh, yeah, you, you, were, you were a coward. Oh, man, you shouldn't have done that. And just really fan that guilt, fan that shame. If I get angry, for example, yeah, you have a right to be angry. I'd be angry too, right? Um, you know that voice isn't from, from God because it's not scriptural. If you ever wonder if it's God speaking to you, does it line up with what scripture says? And if it doesn't, it's not him because God doesn't contradict himself. But Satan will, will speak in half truths. We know that. That's what he does. And it'll sound so true. I do have a right to be mad. Blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, you. someone may have done something that makes you mad. Doesn't give you a right to do what you're doing, though. And so these are the things you've got to discern uh, in this process. So as you're being carried by Jesus and you've gone through your forgiveness process and you figured out your triggers, then you've got to figure out where Satan's trying to break your legs and trying to make you act in inappropriate ways based on your PTSD. And whether that's suicidal ideation or cutting or hurting yourself, homicidal ideation, this idea of hurting others, you're screaming and yelling and raging and, uncon and uncontrolled emotional responses to things, your depression, your anxiety, uh, your isolation, yeah, I, whatever it is for me, the hypervigilance that I have where I don't feel safe, uh, those kind of things, all of that is in my head and it's in your head. And all of it is, from, uh, is something that is a, a great target for Satan. And so what we got to do is try to get healthy in our head. Uh, I've used this, I've talked about this before. If you break your arm, you go to the doctor and get your arm fixed, get in a cast. Well, if you've got something wrong with your head, you go to someone that can help you with your head. So you go to a counselor and you make sure that there's this, this healing component of, of the Holy Spirit. You got to have this, I've talked about this and talked about this. You're not going to get well without, without a spiritual peace. Now, here's what's fascinating. I just remember this. The VA did a study uh, on folks that were struggling with PTSD. And uh, they had two control groups. Uh, I think it was a double blind study. And they were looking at one that did not have faith as part of their regiment and the others that did. And the numbers were significant in terms of those having recovery uh, and improvement that had faith. And I'll just tell you, you know, uh, for me, it's a, it's one of those duh moments. Um, you got to have faith. You got to have God by your side. You need Jesus walking with you. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what helps you through these, these things. Um, now, I'm not saying again, take your meds if you need to. Uh, get your counseling. Do, do that three-legged stool we've talked about. Uh, but you got to have Jesus. And what you got to do is you got to look for the insights from Jesus to tell you the things you don't know. You got to connect dots that you don't see, and Jesus will do that for you. Um, and you need to do it his way. You got to pray for those who persecuted you. You got to forgive your enemies. You've got to uh, turn the other cheek. You got to walk away from it. 
um, yeah, you got to forgive as you've been forgiven. You've got you've got to you, you know you you just got to uh, be able to use this as something to glorify God instead of having it be something that tears you down. Um, and I, I just want to be candid. It's a lifetime process. Uh, as as he, as much healing as I have had, which has been tremendous since the time I was 17. I'm 55 now. Um, in the last 38 years, is that right? Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. It's a, it's a freaking miracle. People that knew me back in college, for example, and knew who I was and all that, wouldn't know me today. Uh, I'm I'm not that guy. I'm a new creation in Christ. I am I am different. Um, but I'm not completely there. I still have my issues, and I still struggle with making sure that I'm applying everything I'm talking to you about. I I, I don't always succeed. Um, if you live with someone with PTSD, understand that there's something called secondary PTSD, which is something that um, can affect a spouse or a, a family member or whatever, where you're around their bad behavior so much that it starts to affect you. But understand you should have compassion because there's causation, there's trauma. This isn't just something that the guy's just a jerk. Um, if there's a message I could get out there to people who have been around, those of us who have this condition, we're not doing it because we're jerks. We're not doing it because we don't like you. We don't, we're not doing it because, um, you know, we're just uh, these, these uh, cro magnumin kind of guys. We are broken. We are hurt. We are, uh, you know, like I said, if I had a broken arm and a sling on, you'd feel bad for me. You can't see my brain. You don't know how broken it is. Um, but it is our responsibility, those of us that have PTSD, to get fixed. You don't get to ignore it. You don't get to, uh, um, you know, pretend you're not the one with the problem uh, and become manipulative and, and all those type of things because that can happen. Uh, I think that th that's the mistake I made when I was younger is I didn't take ownership of the fact that I was as as um, traumatized as I was because you don't really see it. And I didn't have an elder around me to walk me through this. I didn't have any mentor to say, you know, Tom, you really need some help. Uh, I had some peers, but that wasn't really going to be great. So, yeah, I, I think that that if you're living with someone like this, um, have compassion and empathy because they're struggling and they may not even tell you, but they are. If you're someone that has this, get help. Trust me. Uh, I wish I had done it 30 years earlier than I did in terms of walking through this process. Um, I wish that when I was in college, I had uh, done the right things and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had <laughs> all the hardship for the next probably 40, eh, 25 years that I had, um, that I had. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, I uh, just wanted to give you a, it's been a long video on PTSD. It's a very complicated subject. You should uh, study it if you have it or you think you have it. And uh, uh, remember that God has answers to this stuff. It's in Scripture. you got to forgive. you got to lean on Jesus. He has to be your strength uh, when you're weak. You have to turn the other cheek and pray for your those who persecute you. You got to you got to do that stuff. It's not just it's not just Christian idioms. It's not just feel good crap. It's the stuff you got to do as Christians. Um, and the reason is God loves you. And the reason that He wants you to do this stuff is because it's the beginning of your healing. And if you do that, then you can fight the spiritual battle against Satan, and you can win. And so this is this is why he tells us all this stuff. It's not just platitudes that you know Christians throw around. It's advice for everyday living, so that uh, you can have life and have it abundantly, as Jesus said. You can have peace beyond understanding, and you can have the truth, and it will set you free. I mean, that's what all this is about. So, uh, yeah, touch base with me if uh, you need more information on PTSD. Um, because I'm happy to give you resources, whatever it might be. And beyond that, I just want to wish you a fantastic, I think it's Wednesday. Uh, I think maybe I'll shave by Friday. I don't know. I, I'm homebound here, so I'm not going anywhere. So maybe I don't have to. Hope you're all doing well. I sure miss seeing you all. And uh, we'll catch up with you the next time I do something, which I think is going to be Friday night. Yeah, First Stone Service, Friday night, 7 p.m. Okay, talk to you then.